Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? I'm smiling. Can you tell that I'm smiling? <laughs> um, my name is Eileen Lynch. I work here at the Hogan Historical Museum on Programming and Development. Um, this lecture is our first in a series of talks that were created to raise awareness and appreciation for some of New Jersey's uh, history making women. Um, and also the legacies, of course, they left behind. The next lecture in this series will be Sunday, October 4th at 4 p.m. Uh, that will be that will feature Jen Wallach's book, uh, The Richest Woman in America, Penny Green in the Gilded Age. I also want to let everyone know that this lecture has been generously supported through a grant from the New Jersey Council on the Humanities. Uh, which is why we're able to offer them for free. We are also uh, supported through a yearly grant, a general operating support grant from the New Jersey uh, Historical Commission. So the money for these grants, the money for these lectures comes from you, the New Jersey taxpayer. This lecture is your tax dollars at work. Um, today's talk, we have historian Linda Gordon. And she's going to look at the legacy of one of America's most iconic artists, Dorothy Lang, A Life Beyond Limits. This book uh, has won many awards, including the prestigious Bancroft Prize. Um, and Professor Gordon is one of the few authors to be awarded that prize twice. She has spent her career writing on issues of feminism, gender, social welfare policies in US history, and currently teaches at NYU. Please welcome Linda Gordon. Hi, everyone. Those of you who are here and those who are virtually here, um, I'm really delighted that you uh, came out. And uh, I can promise you, you will be able to see some beautiful, beautiful photographs. And I also particularly want to thank the Hoboken Historical Museum for presenting this and for many other uh, programs and the riches that they have given to their uh, Now, in lectures about Dorothy Lane, I always have to begin with this photograph. How many people have seen this photograph before? Everybody. Some might call it the most famous photograph, photograph in the world. I, I don't know if that's true. Uh, but very few people who know this photograph know the name of the person who wrote the photograph. Uh, and her, the fact that they don't is part of the story uh, I'm going to tell. Um, much of her life, uh, well, let me, let me start at the beginning. She, she was born here, as you know, she was born in 1898. And several things about her childhood here were extremely important. Uh, one is that when she was seven years old, she had polio. And she had a slight limp all of her life. She couldn't quite put her left foot all the way on the ground. And when I first began doing this research, I thought, well, this is a very minor disability, right? Uh, but when she was a middle-aged woman teaching photography in San Francisco, she asked her students uh, to bring in photographs of, quote, where they live. And by that, she didn't mean their house. She meant something much more profound about what they thought about their life. So her students said, well, why don't you bring a picture of where you live? And this is what she thought. This is a photograph of her foot. And it certainly made me see how naive and insensitive I was when I thought, oh, this is just a minor disability, it didn't matter. It just mattered a lot to her. One thing is that uh, as, because her uh, leg never was normal, her mother got her into long skirts or pants, even before pants were, uh, were okay for women, to hide the disability. Um, then the other uh, major thing that happened was the split uh, between her parents. And this is very complicated because Dorothea was extremely angry with her father. Her, her birth name was Nutshorn. And 
Sometime later, she, when she could, she adopted her mother's name, Lang, is a maternal name. Now, she, Lang represented her father as having just deserted her. But in fact, having looked at the records, in fact, it was a pretty mutual separation. But you have to remember that divorce and separation was not all that common. And it did throw her mother into having to earn a living uh, for herself. This, uh, she, got, she got a job, she first she worked actually as a parole officer in uh, either Hoboken or Wimbabwe, I can't remember, but then she got a job at a library in the Lower East Side of New York. And her daughter, who was then an early adolescent, would ride the ferry with her every day into the city and go, go to school there. And so she was actually educated in New York City. She went to a high school called Wadley High, I don't know if you know it, but believe it or not, it was the only high school for girls in New York City at the time. Um, she found a, a job at Portrait Studio, not with Alfred Stieglitz, who said what she met later, but someone who probably have not heard of. And she became absolutely fascinated with photography. First she was just answering the phone and trying to sell portraits and so on, but after a while she was so enthusiastic that on um, an her employer gave loaned her a camera and said, why don't you try it? And that was it. Her life was photography, full time. Uh, at a certain point she got restless and with a girlfriend, uh, they traveled a boat and train, it was very complicated, all the way up to San Francisco. Uh, and she became a Californian for the rest of her life. Opened a portrait studio. And what is uh, this young woman who had learned photography but had no credentials opened a portrait studio. And within two years, it was one of the most famous portrait studios in San Francisco. It was a portrait studio that was favored by the rich and the artistic. Um, and they loved it because she made portraits like this. This is a period in which if you went to a portrait studio, they usually would shoot your head on, and they would have a lot of fake props. You've probably seen those things where you have robes, you put your hands on something. This is not her style. Uh, this is uh, the famous composer Eric Schwab, and this way of just representing him in a very thoughtful moment was really characteristic, and the people who were her clients began to really like this. Here's a, oops, let me go back. Uh, the wood uh, at the top um, actually was one of her very, very close friends, um, and this is also kind of daring. Because there's pretty, it's pretty, we don't, we don't know if she was nude, but it's pretty low cut. But again, she, she's not trying to make this woman hope pretty in a conventional way. She soon uh, met this artist, and for all of her life, this artist, Maynard Dixon, was far more famous than she was. If you Google him, you'll see he's a painter mainly of Western American landscape. Uh, he was not exactly a wonderful husband. He liked to go on these long photographic trips, uh, living in Dorothy alone. But furthermore, almost as soon as they got together, he had an eight-year-old child from her early marriage, and he just handed that child to Dorothy Lang. The child and Lang were closer in age. He was 20 years older than Lang. And they had a terrible relationship. This girl was furious, as you might understand, with this woman who had sort of taken her father away. And then she had two children of her own uh, with Mayor Dixon. And a lot of that time, she was mother and earning a living for, for the family from her photography studio. She was an incredibly hardworking person. Um, then the Great Depression hit. 
And as it happened, her studio was in sort of the very center of San Francisco, and she could look out the window and see scenes like this. This is a soup kitchen. And she, you know, I could show you hundreds more of the depression. Got the guys sleeping on park benches, people lined up to try to get help you can manage. Uh, this was the first experience of not photographing a portrait in a studio. And I want you to look at something about the structure of this, uh, which is quite interesting. You only see one guy. The rest are all the backs of guys, right? And you will only see all of his face. And by doing that, in, in that kind of composition, it becomes a much more powerful photograph than if there had been a lot of faces in it. And I want to go back just to make a little point about photography and ask you to look back. This is the same thing, written large. When she first started to photograph this woman, the two children, naturally were curious. They had their face, they were looking at the photographer. They may never have seen a camera, certainly not the one of the giant ones that she did. She asked them to turn their heads away. And she did that because she saw that this woman's face was extraordinarily expressive and also very beautiful, and she didn't want anything to detract from it. Um, what well, um, the point I'm trying to make here is that she was always a portrait photographer. But what she began to do was to turn the same eye, the same approach that she directed at some of the very rich and directed at the poor. Um, you'll see some of that later. Um, in, the, in the Depression, uh, she uh, had what had, was well known enough that she had a little exhibit of her portraits, and a man called Paul Taylor went to see it, and he was amazingly impressed. He had done a little photography himself. He thought these were terrific. He uh, sought her out, and he got her a job for the federal government. The federal government established within the Department of Agriculture, something called the Farm Security Administration, which was trying to help rural people who had been really badly hurt by the depression. But they had a small little subgroup of about a dozen photographers, and their job was to go everywhere and document the depression. Uh, she was the only one on the West Coast who was hired uh, which may have been different to what she photographed. But you know, so at first, some of those other photographers were taking pictures well of the Dust Bowl, of deserted homes, of uh, you know, people uh, in bad spirits. Uh, she had a very different idea of what to do, uh, as you will soon see. Now, Paul Taylor and she fell in love. And if Maynard Dixon, I Excuse my language. I think of Mary Dixon as the husband from hell, but Paul Taylor was the husband from heaven. He adored her, and he thought she was a genius, and he would do anything to help her. He had a very remarkable career of his own, uh, teaching at UC Berkeley. Uh, but uh, one of the things that he, he was an agricultural economist, and he was studying uh, the agricultural economy in the state of California, which, as many of you may know, was very, very dependent on migrant farm workers who were among the poorest and worst off people in the country. And a majority of those farm workers were of Mexican origin. Paul Taylor became fluent in Spanish. In fact, he, he did quite an extraordinary thing. He went to Mexico to visit some of the villages that the migrant farm workers had come from that he, that he could understand what they were doing. But anyway, they became a team, and whenever possible, uh, Paul Taylor went along with her. Uh, this is a picture of her from a typical first. She may have been disabled, she was very strong. She had stamina, uh, advanced degree, she could 
go on and on for many, many hours in the incredible heat of California Central Valley in the, in the summers. Uh, but she also had heavy cameras. She was frequently a camera that weighed something, especially had film that had 50 pounds. And furthermore, they, they don't, these cameras didn't use raw films. They used glass plates that slid in and out. And so she usually had to have a, an assistant. And whenever possible, uh, Paul went with her. But this necessitated uh, an extremely heavy and painful decision. Uh, she was not the only Western photographer. She was not the only, only woman photographer. She was also the only photographer who was a parent. And by this time, she had the three children, Maynard's one, her two, and Paul Taylor's three children. And they wanted her to photograph on the road. That was what the job was. Um, I, I have often mentioned this in talking about it, and when I, uh, when I tell you what, what she did, uh, I often get a gasp from the audience, so prepare yourself. She had the children in foster care with a family, and she would see them on weekends. Uh, it wasn't an easy decision. I think she had some guilt about it for the rest of her life. But as I say, this was a job offer she could not refuse. And if it hadn't been for this job offer, no one would have heard of her. No one would know any of her portraits. Um, okay, so I said she was always a portrait photographer. And here, I just put two together, two images. One was uh, a very wealthy San Francisco uh, woman, one of the benefactors of one of the major museums. And the other was a cotton picker resting uh, with a, in, in this kind of heat, uh, the, right, the farm workers would usually take a break in the middle of the day when it was at highest and sit down or relax and retreat. But uh, what I want you to see is this same uh, kind of really striking uh, images of people. Some critics have sometimes said that Dorothy Lang only photographed lovely people. She absolutely denied that, and she had a theory behind it. She said, everyone looks good if you can get them to relax into their natural body language. You talk to a portrait photographer, every one of them knows that when most people are posing, they stiffen up, unless you're a professional model or a professional actress. Her technique, was to move very, very slowly. She tried to converse with everyone with, when it was someone Mexican. Uh, Paul would often translate for her. I think that she sometimes exaggerated her limp in order, one, to be less threatening, and two, to move even more slowly. Um, this was what she had done in the portrait studio. And it was also what she did uh, to these people. And uh, let me point out, I'll say to you, I can explain it later, later, but this was not a period in which you could see beautiful, respectful photographs of people as poor as this woman. Um, she was doing a job, remember, for uh, documenting the, the uh, depression. But what she wanted to do was to document poverty in pictures that were at the same time beautiful. She didn't think that uh, showing pictures of people at their worst, the driver was going to help. She was a huge, I might say, a huge fan of Franklin Roosevelt. She wanted to do any, everything she could to help the New Deal. And she had the sense to know that photographs that really made people only victims were not as powerful. Um, I chose this one because you can see this is a Mexican, uh, uh, also a cotton paper. Uh, you can see how poor she is from her clothes, her bedraggled sweater. Uh, her daughter 
uh, many of the farm workers had to bring their children with them into the fields because they had nothing else to do with them. Um, but in the Depression context, this is another one, this is sharecropper from Louisiana. In the Depression context, uh, making her subjects attractive was also, I think, a New Deal political statement. It was a statement that said, these people are right down now, but they are respectable people. They are people who are real citizens. They are people who have potential. And in some ways, you could say she was often photographing potential. She was photographing a person as they might look if they were in slightly better circumstances. This one is interesting because you can tell from the picture what she's doing. She's having a conversation with him. And she wrote captions for these photographs. And most, most of the uh, uh, photographers would have a caption that said, you know, the name of the town, the date, uh, the name of the county, the name of the farm. Lang wrote these captions that were like paragraphs, biographies. She would say, this, this is a person who uh, came from uh, Oklahoma, where they grew corn. Then came first the Dust Bowl. Remember the Dust Bowl that wiped them out and they began becoming migrants. First they went to this county, this county. Then they went there. You were like details about the family lives of, of these people. Um, there's uh, another interesting thing about these photographs, and that is. The, uh, did you guys skip something? Did you skip one? What? Bloodful Cropper. Oh, yeah. Where is it? Ooh, they must be out of place here. I have to find them. There he is. I, again, I just got him right here. No, no this is. Dr. Dr. Her. There he is. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is another shape, however. Um, you, you can see, well, you might just, Imagine what was going on between him and her. Uh, he's not beautiful, but he's reasonably good looking. He is not smiling from the camera. He's thoughtful. Uh, she is trying to create really respectful images of very, very poor people and to have the, that those images have the same kind of weight uh, that her, uh, her studio. Uh, uh, studio clients in here. Now I have to go back to this woman. Um, she was also interested, and I found there's something very touching about this, because she was still a very young woman uh, during this period. She found herself interested in photographing older women. And this is again a, a place where you don't use see plenty of snapshots that Children take their grandparents, but you don't often see really a strong portraits of older women. And uh, as you see, also she's not smiling. In fact, she might even have been a little uh, peeved or something about having her photograph taken. She is a migrant from a group that is a car in which she and her family drive from crop to crop. Now, um, let me just show this one. Uh, this is uh, another sharecropper, another very old woman. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, in Mississippi. I don't see it. Two more of these I just want to comment on. Again, look at the guy's attitude. It's almost like a little suspicious. <clears throat> He's not giving, he doesn't give himself to the camera. I also want you to notice something else that was very characteristic of her that I'll return to later, and that is his posture. Because in a subtle way, he's very graceful. He's got a slight lean, uh, he's leaning on a, a tool. Uh, he's, 
he's uh, got a lot of dignity. With this guy, uh, a Mexican, um, a Mexican uh, Californian, he is doing what, as I said, the migrant farm workers did in the middle of the day. They lay down under the tree uh, to get away from the heat. And what's interesting about this is absolutely typical line. She didn't ask him to get up. She talked to him while he was lying down. And for all I know, she may have talked to him through Paul Taylor, speaking Spanish, but it's obvious that he is in a conversation with her. Uh, that's what he's doing. Now, she didn't often make photographs that were overtly political. I've got the wrong slides here, and anyway, I'll do it. This is a Mississippi uh, plantation owner, and in back of him are his crows, his two crows. Um, he's in a very aggressive posture, right? He's got his foot up on uh, public, not the running board, but the back, back uh, bumper of the car. His croppers are has their their backwards. They're they're not the center of the photograph. Uh, if you look really carefully at the far left edge, you see Paul Taylor's hand, and he was talking to this guy and trying to understand. And what what I think made this photograph so powerful is that in some in, in some ways it visually represented the actual economic and social power relations between uh, a plantation owner and, a, um, and their brothers. Um, I, I did get up here some of the wrong pictures, so I'm going to see if I can get to where I want to get. Okay. okay. If you had asked Dorothy Lang what she thought was women's position in the world where it should be, she would say very conservative things. She did say, you know, I, I, she, you know, she would say, well, women are naturally uh, the kind of people who know how to take care of children, who can make homes beautiful. Uh, interesting, she's describing the life of a woman totally unlike her. Um, but if you look at her photographs, you do not see at all conventional images of women. This is a, a, a cotton picker who is weighing their cotton. You see that tripod? That's you get your these uh, farm workers get paid by the by the weight, and you take your. Uh, and weigh it, and that determines how much you can weigh. And let me say, before we have the phrase of lightest cotton, I have been told by people who are no more about agriculture than I do that a, a, a full bag of cotton can weigh 100 pounds. Um, here's another one. She's, um, migrant farm workers. Uh, had to live in sort of camps that they could put up. Sometimes the uh, owner of the, of the huge farm would have a kind of set of cabins, but often they didn't, and they were really just camping out. Uh, she did a lot of that kind of picture, and what you see here is a woman who is washing clothes. Another kind of labor, she has many, many, many photographs of women who are workers as well as being women. Um, here's another couple, but and again, uh, the, the woman on the left is, is one of these migrant farmers. That's the tent she was living in. The woman on the right is uh, another one of these cotton workers. But again, you see the the portrait style of land taking these uh, really, uh, in many ways, very attractive portraits of these people. Here's another set. Um, I, I won't have time to go into it, but let me just say briefly something about the lower picture. 
Uh, there are scores of the pictures I call Madonna's. Uh, this woman is in a lean to. This is the Margaret Farmer. This is where she lives. If you look, she's got a, a kind of tarp over them. It's kept up by a, one place by a pole, another place it's tied to a tree, to an eucalyptus, I think. She is nursing a baby, which is really a risque thing for photography. This could never have been published at the time. We just don't show that in the T20s. And if you look carefully at the right side of the picture, you see her husband's a paw of him. He's lying down, he's out of the picture. She, she made some photographs of her with the husband. But um, I think what she was doing, when you see the look of photographs that I haven't shown you of the husband, he's very, very, very depressed. His body language, everything about defeatist is the word I want. Look at this woman's face carefully. She has absolutely nothing, right? But if you look at the steely expression in her eyes, you can see that this is a person who is going to protect this baby with whatever she has to do to protect that baby. Now here's another, even more shocking Madonna. Shocking because it's blood. Um, this woman, interestingly enough, uh, probably refused to take off her sunglasses because I wouldn't be surprised if Brian would have asked her to in order to show her face more clearly. Um, and she too has come in from the fields and has this uh, a sense of toughness about her. Uh, again, this is a very unconventional image of Madonna. Um, this is another one of a different kind of photograph that, uh, not, I didn't invent this term, so a friend of mine is a photography critic, called them her Madonnas. Um, she made many, many more pictures of fathers with children than she did of mothers with children, and that is a fascinating thing, especially given her rage against her father. And someone might, some people, you know, I'm not into psychoanalyzing this, but some people might say this is a woman who felt father, unfathered. Um, but she's really showing uh, these guys in a very, uh, very unusual way, holding babies. And again, I think there must be 200 uh, of, of these. Uh, on another point, just uh, not about the Madonna, but I just want you to notice, this is one of these kind of photographs that has a lot of information in it, if you look carefully. If you look in the door, on the left side of the door, you see the edge of an older girl. My guess is that this man, the Mexican-American farm worker, probably told her to stay inside. He wasn't really sure of what was happening with this uh, photographer company. You can see what they're living in. You see the patches, uh, uh, roof patches, uh, how they built a shelter. You see the upside down boots, which you see in every single farm workers uh, at the end of the day because the boots are full of sand. They may actually be full of, of insects. And what you do is you rinse them out and you turn them upside down. You also see the wash tub. This is the other thing that, you know, no matter how, how migrant you are, you always carry a wash tub because it's the only way that you can wash clothes. And you might also point out that um, this, this is very bedraggled, but it's completely clean. It's been swept. There's no uh, debris on the ground. Then another very interesting thing with in relation to gender. That guy is in the same position as was the, um, the plantation owner. It's an aggressive position. Notice a couple other things about him. Look at his shoes. They are bright white. They are especially clean. He got dressed up for this photographer. Look at his hair with the perfect part. He is really making himself look good. Um, something I find pretty interesting. Um, here, for some reason, I 
guess it's slid up those next images. Is it four by Mars? No, the next one after that? No, no, never mind. Um, this is another Padana. I the, what's the blank is a picture of this, and I didn't make it into there because it was another one. And I wanted it would show two different fathers in very different parts of the country, one of them black, one of them white, with a child with the exact same uh, uh, posture in relation to the child. Uh, the the child is it's a posture that is at once protective with the hand on the head of the child, but it's also a crowd. This is my child, and if you look, the guy has work clothes on, but the child is all cleaned up. This is, again, uh, something of pride. Um, I argue uh, in the book that one of the things about Lang that's unusual is her unusual sensitivity to bodies. And she actually made many photographs of people which you don't see their faces, uh, photographs that are very uh, telling. The, the guy on the left is a farm worker. Uh, you see from his posture how completely dejected he is. The caption said, I don't know if you can see in the picture that he was actually trying to figure out what his earnings would be. The person on the right is a, a person in an internment camp, Manzanar. And here you see from a distance, again, the body is telling you something. The slight slump in the body of the body, the, the guy all alone in this kind of uh, place that they were living in, they often took uh, uh, unused horse stables or chicken hoops to uh, make it possible to, uh, uh, to house these people. Um, she could also do happy. So far, I've really talked about most of her stuff. It's pretty heavy, a little bit sad. Uh, but here are some more of these pictures that I think of as body pictures. There are no faces. The wheelbarrow man, I'm sure you would see, is the obvious uh, metaphor for the Depression. The wheelbarrow is upside down. The whole economy is upside down. The guy is slumped over. Um, it's a beautiful composition. In, in terms of attention to the body, this is another one I want to bring out. Um, there is such a grace in the position of this woman's hand, and I couldn't help but put it next to a later in her life, uh, Lang uh, traveled uh, all over the world while Paul, with Paul Taylor, who was a, um, he worked for U.S. aid and United Nations visiting my places. This is a Balinese dancer. That in which Lang just wanted a photograph of the hand because of its grace. But here, even in work, again, you see the in the effort of pushing that plow, you also see the body as doing the work. And then, finally, feet. Uh, she obviously really cared about feet, and she was very concerned about it. And she made again so many pictures of feet. Now, in some ways, these feet are also metaphors. They're designed, or they're what's what uh, is called synecdoche, that you see a piece of the body, but you were really intended to see, especially in the top one, uh, the hard work that this person has done. But on the other hand, at the bottom, you see uh, uh, also a sharecropper uh, or micro farm worker. Whose feet are just in this elegantly clasped position. You know, it could have been a ballet dancer with those kind of feet. Um, okay, one more thing, and that has a lot to do with gender and women. Um, Lang was a portrait artist, but she also increasingly uh, began to try to find a way to show relationships 
between people. So I want you to look at this. Um, these are two uh, World War II war workers, both of them. He's got what I think is a union button on his cap. I'm not really sure. Can't, I never was able to make it out. And this is also Richmond, California. But the tension between those people is just vibrating between those two bodies. We don't know what the issue is, but we can tell this is not uh, an entirely uh, relaxed or joyful meeting. It's a similar picture in which you have a mother looking at a very, very troubled daughter. You don't know what the issue is, um, but you know that they're troubled. Um, okay, what, um, when I first uh, was going to uh, write this, the book that I wrote, I wanted to title the book Visual Democracy. Because, it, as I said, I see Lang trying to use a camera to draw people who are usually seen as the dregs down and out and to bring them into a position as respectable, responsible citizens. Um, I never could use the, that title because my editor said, oh, you'll never sell. Uh, he's probably right. Um, I think that's what she was trying to do. I don't think it's correct to think of her as a political photographer, because in a certain way, she really wasn't, she did love Franklin Roosevelt, but you know, so did a huge majority of people, and she was very, very supportive of the New York, but she really wanted help to get to uh, people in this absolute crisis. But she never joined a political organization, she wasn't a person who uh, marched, until finally, uh, one anecdote I want to say, just as she was dying, she died uh, in her early 70s of, of very, very painful cancer. Um, so in 1964, she died in 65, she got a letter from the photographers of an organization known as SNCC, the Southern Nonviolent Coordinating Committee the most uh, uh, militant activist group of civil rights uh, people working in the South. And the letter said, we love your photography. We want you to come and mentor us and help us learn to do better photography of the civil rights movement. She couldn't do it. She was much too sick. But she said that she just felt honored. And she also made a point that's really interesting because this is 1960s and she said some of the same people that I photographed in the 1930s who looked like they were totally defeated these are now the same people who are rising up to claim their rights so I think of her again as not a political person but a person with a kind of heart in the right place about all this and, and certainly uh, you know, taking the risk to take the very, very critical uh, photographs. Um, I just want to end with one uh, comment in case you're interested. The, most of her photographs are done for the uh, governor in the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress has a terrific search engine. If you go to the Library of Congress, you go to the Princeton Photographs Division, you could type in Dorothea Lang and Donkey, and you get every photograph of hers that had a donkey in it. And these photographs are entirely free to the public. Uh, anyone can use them. You, if you want to buy a print, you have to pay for the, a small amount to get them to make a print of it, but you don't have to, uh, um, you don't have to get, play, pay for permission to use them. This is also why so people, so few people knew her name. When her photographs were published, they were never signed. This was not, uh, she was not being treated in the way we treat major photographers today, who are, you know, a signed picture is worth many times more than an unsigned picture. 
Um, I, I also just well, the last thing I'll say, I have noticed just as uh, in the 1960s the civil rights workers got interested in what she was doing, I have noticed that in the last couple of years there's been much more attention paid to Dorothy Lane. You'll see her mentioned much more often. There's a, a major show of her work at the uh, Museum of Modern Art. Uh, I think it has to do with the period we're in in this country, in which we are once again dealing with, with a, from, tremendous problems of poverty, inequality, uh, racial and class inequality. And I think somehow when that happens, her photographs begin to speak to people. So I'm going to stop now. I think I, I helped you too long anyway. And then, She lived through the World War II, she lived through the Cold War, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I realized that I could tell the story of her life while also uh, using a lot of history to provide context. And I'm really glad I did because now I've done several other things about photography and I just love doing it. Linda, hi, this is Billy. I just want to thank you. That was so. It was like an education. It was fantastic. Thank you so much for bringing Dorothy Lang to life. Yes. yes. I have another question. Uh, Linda, did, did, did this inspire you to take up photography or to start taking photos? No. <laughs> it's funny. I, I think I'm the world's worst photographer. You know, I'm trying. Everything is out of focus or I'm kind of grounding out. But it sure is I, I just love looking at photography and being able to write about it. Um, and I had to I had to teach myself. Uh, you know, when I first started I'll also see, you know, just as I was so naive about her disability, I also thought, well, I'm I'm not a photography expert, but I'm just gonna talk about her life. I don't need to talk about the photography. Uh, that was one of the dumbest things. Photography was her life. She lived every minute photography. I went, was once in the house they lived in uh, long after she died. <laughs> but uh, some people who, her family were living there and they kept several things uh, the way she had them. And at every door, she had a camera hanging so that if she saw something, she could immediately grab it and go out and take a photograph. I mean, this is what her life was. <laughs> Um, just wondering, once she went out into the field and was doing all this government work and documentation and had that support, I just have a hard time imagining her go back to the portrait studio for more um, upper class right. clients. Did she, she never did. She never did. She never did. It's really interesting. I think uh, it may be she had done that portrait studio for 15 years. And those photographs are, are really pretty, pretty amazing, a lot of them. But I think she was already feeling a little confined by that. And I think as soon as she had this opportunity to go out into the world, it was to her just much more fun. And when she 
uh, traveled with Paul Taylor in the 1950s and early 1960s. They traveled all over the world. Um, what you see is that she was fairly adventurous. She, a lone woman, would go out trying to photograph in places where it was not, like in Egypt, where it was not uh, customary for a woman to be doing that, let alone a woman with a camera. So she, like I said, she was disabled, but she had enormous energy and this kind of curiosity uh, to find out about things. I'm just curious because both her and Stieglitz come from Hoboken. Like, if they had maybe become friends or he became, say, a mentor to her, her whole photographic um, path would be completely different. Right. And that is really interesting. They did, of course, know each other. I, I know what she thought of his work. She was extremely uh, respectful and admiring of his work. I don't know what he thought of hers. He may not have uh, liked it. But um, Stevens moved, traveled a different path. Uh, he did do a lot of work, sure, but then he really started making photographs in a way that he's very self consciously making art. You know, it's interesting about Lang, two things. First of all, she really, for a long time, she said, oh, my photographs are not art, they're just pictures. And some of that is because she was married to a painter. And that's art. Mm -hmm. What I do is not art. But it's also true that for a very long time, uh, photography critics uh, denied that what they call, quote, documentary photography could be art. And in fact, I think, that Lang, perhaps along with Walker Evans, uh, were pivotal figures in, uh, in, in denouncing that, that claim and proving that documentary can be art. Then you get into a whole other uh, but very interesting controversy about what makes a photograph documentary. Some people see a photograph as an exact replica of what you see, right? That's wrong in many ways. First of all, a photographer begins by framing, by deciding what's going to be in the picture, what's going to be out of the picture, and so on. But some people I just in the sort of had a fit when I realized that she told those little girls on the head of Florence Thompson, that's the so-called library, when she told them to turn their heads because she was, quote, posing them and therefore is not documentary. She was just said, this is absolute nonsense. What I am doing is I am documenting uh, a, a person. I'm, I'm giving you more understanding of this depression by the way I create this picture that I would have to have been less powerful. Yes, yeah, yeah. um, to me, she kind of seems like the equivalent, the female equivalent, of like Jean Smith. That's like true. Yes, uh, that you're much older oh, than oh, Jean oh, 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 Smith. And um, she uh, she actually, even though she lived on the West Coast, she was in New York a lot. And she actually knew a lot of the later, younger photographers, particularly those in Magnum. I don't know if you know what Magnum is. It's the most elite. Uh, 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 collect, uh, business of photographers uh, has you know, the greatest photographers. Okay. We, have, we have time for one more question. We'll take a question from the internet. This is from Dan Kowalski. Linda, I liked your work on the Klan in the 1920s because my master's thesis at UNC was on the Klan in Buffalo, New York in the 1920s. Do you know what she and Adams thought of the censorship of their internment pictures? Oh, she was furious. She was absolutely furious, but she also understood perfectly because she knew that these pictures, and I'm really, just go to the library and get this book and pound it, and you'll see what I mean. It's also in the back. She knew that the army was not like these pictures. She thought, well, maybe they just wouldn't go and look at them. They'll just do what, what they do with them. Um, but she absolutely knew that. However, I don't think 
I think she, uh, her thinking about that was formed by Paul Taylor. Paul Taylor was a really extraordinary guy uh, in many ways, and that he was, as I said, an agricultural economist who was interested in people who do the work of agriculture, but he also was uh, very anti-racist, and it happened that a lot of Japanese Americans went to the UC Berkeley to study agriculture because they learned more sophisticated uh, techniques of farming. And so he personally had uh, a lot of some Japanese American students. And I, I do want to remind you about the internment. Every child and every uh, uh, teenager and every college student were taken away. They couldn't uh, be educated. So he was really, uh, I think, the person that pointed out, that made her understand that there was no justification for doing this. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you.